people that said, hey, the employee you know, was happy on the EX side. When you looked at it, people actually said the food tasted better. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive a return on investment from their investments in CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Greg Bird, who's a friend that I've enjoyed working with from Qualtrics. Greg is uh, gonna have a really interesting perspective because he's worked in both the private and public sectors uh, with, uh, with Qualtrics and have a lot of perspective to share, I'm sure. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Thanks, Matt. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. To get us started, Greg, I'd love to talk about what you see as some of the most important innovations that companies are focused on as they modernize their approach to customer listening. Yeah, thanks. Great question, uh, Matt. And I would say that as I talk to customers, both in the commercial section of the business and also in the public sector piece, uh, you see customers that are trying to move from a siloed listening and action approach to a consolidated action and approach. And what that really means is pulling all the information together across those various channels, consolidating it together and understanding how that's impacting somebody's experience across all those different pieces. Ultimately, that also means that they're also trying to figure out, hey, when I start responding, how do I start using something like AI inside of that world too? So we're seeing some automation of responses in the contact center side. We're also seeing things like summarization of conversations. So all those pieces are really where those innovations and where the next step is going inside of CX. I think you hit on a really important point uh, with silos, which is that CX is a team sport and that there's different parts of the organization that touch CX, an organization that's more mature in their capabilities for how they go after CX may have already brought uh, different parts of the company together to collaborate. I'm not even getting into the org design, but just collaboration um, of how they work together. And so you've got the call centers, the contact centers, you've got the kind of the digital products like the website and the mobile app and other experiences. You've got on-premise or you know in-store you know experiences. Uh, on location experiences that have frontline employees in addition to the contact center that touch the customer. So there's all these different pieces, sales, marketing service that touch the customer that need to be brought together. And a lot of the modernization have to do with tapping into new listening posts. There's all this unstructured data that exists that often is not used or is not connected. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, there's there's all kinds of, I mean, everybody sits on a gold mine in a way, right? The reality is every organization sits on top of a set of communications, a set of unstructured data today that they are already captured. So being able to get access to that is something that's key for the future. It's not just a, um, a scale of one to 10 or one to five that's asking a question that's a structured question. It's really getting into that unstructured side and starting to understand the pieces of what is somebody sharing with you? Like I always say that the, you know, every bad journey ends in a phone call, right? So when you start thinking about all those channels and all those conversations that are occurring before you actually get to the phone call, there are things that are going wrong. Nobody picks up the phone for fun. So ultimately the goal inside of here is to be able to listen across both the structured feedback that's coming in and also all that unstructured feedback that is already inside of an organization. With a lot of customer experience, um, you know, people talk about like voice of the customer and listening to the customer. I like to step back from that and actually think that there's a brand promise and there's a customer experience. And your brand promise is how you want the customer to feel and think about you in their experience with you. You know, the customer experience is how they feel about themselves. The brand promise is how that, you know, you want them to feel and then talk about your brand, right? So if the customer experience is not congruent with the brand promise, then you got an issue, right? So a lot of customer listening is about understanding whether the CX is congruent. And what's really powerful now is that you can start actually listening for a whole lot more than you can ask for in a survey. You know, so that you can actually start understanding and unpacking what is the brand promise, what is it we want to happen in the different steps of the experience. And so, for example, in the call center, what is it that you want to go on in that call? And is, it, is the call actually congruent with what you wanted? 
you can now you can start listening in a way that is much more powerful than having to kind of put it all into a survey. That's right. There's an ability inside of all this to be able to step back and listen inside of those channels for the way that you want your customers to be expressing what you're trying to accomplish. And the real question inside of all that is actually, are they expressing it that way? Or is there a different way that you're coming across? If you want to lead them in that direction, you need to understand the people that are feeling that way and emphasize those things. If you feel like maybe you want to change your direction because you misunderstood and that there's a better promise that's actually being achieved for your most valuable customers, you can listen for that too and start to change the direction of where you're going. We've seen customers go through both of those kind of evolutions. You know, just sticking with the contact center again, um, you know, a lot of people use the more modern approaches to take the, you know, the custom verbatims for the calls and then start looking in the call itself to see, okay, um, you know, is this call... Uh, you summarize the call, look for trends in the calls, but ultimately you want to not just close the loop on a problem, but start adapting the training to get the people to deliver the call more the way you want. And if you don't have a listening post to know whether the call is going the way you want, then it requires a lot of listening in. You'd have to have a lot of recordings and coaches listening and, and, and listening to all the calls to figure out what to train. But now you can actually summarize and see whether the call is doing what you want without having to have a human being listen to the entire call. Yeah, you absolutely can, right? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the ability to go into a call to be able to understand uh, each one of the pieces that are occurring inside of there, everything from an opening into a closing, which is probably the simplest things, right, to something that's more akin to, hey, there's an agent having a conversation here that is representing my brand. If you're representing my brand, there's a specific set of things that I want you to accomplish inside of this call. Are you showing empathy for a challenge that an individual is facing? So if somebody's having a bad day, uh, everything from um, just take an example of insurance, right? Somebody's having a claim from an insurance perspective. How do you react to that as an agent? Ultimately listening and saying, hey, I'm sorry, I understand that you're having a terrible uh, problem right now that you're facing for your individual life. And being able to be empathetic about that before servicing them for what the specific need means that you're meeting a brand promise above and beyond servicing the simple need, right? Servicing the simple need is a baseline, but being empathetic and being human in that interaction and somebody feeling that back from you is key for you being successful inside of achieving a combination of servicing and that brand promise. You know, one, some of the fun work that we've done together has actually been taking that brand promise and then uh, figuring out a way to define the attributes that live up to that brand promise and then listening for those more systematically. Um, this is something I think that has very broad applicability across industries and across the, both the private and the public sector. So uh, what, are, what are some of your thoughts about... Um, you know, some of the similarities or differences between, you know, private and public sector and how you leverage some of those best practices over into some of the public sector clients you're working with now? Yeah, I mean, there are quite a bit of similarities between them, meaning that um, in both sides, people are starting to progress towards a broader set of listening. And that broader set of listening means more channels. That means voice. It means surveys. It means interactions in any way, shape, or form, uh, chats, emails, um, anything else that you can think of, social media, right? All those pieces are the ability to listen. Those are similar between the two sides. I would say what sets the public sector apart is that the public sector is looking to accomplish that across all individuals that they support, right? Some people have less access uh, to a phone or to uh, digital access. So how do you make sure that they get the information at their fingertips? And how do you make sure that they're served just as well as the next individual down the line? So being able to take and ingest all the information across all those channels again, gives you some sense of where those friction points are for even the most underserved. And how do you take and improve those? The second thing I think that is fundamentally a difference between commercial and the public sector is that public sector for sure is constrained by both people and by money or revenue or things that they need to control from a dollar's perspective, right? They need to do more with less. And what that means is that there's a bar. Right? We were talking today to uh, one of our public sector customers and basically they said, look, 
when we reach a certain number of phone calls, that's all that we can handle. So the rest of the people that are above and beyond that number in a given month are folks that don't get through. So the goal inside of here is not necessarily to make more money or decrease your cost. The answer is the goal inside of here is to serve that public more with more accessibility and more people through the engine, if you will. So be becoming more efficient inside of the actions and the things that need to be done to serve people and in a way that is human, of course, because government wants to be more human as well, right, is that we get folks across the finish line and make them successful with what they need to get done to be served by the state, the county, the local government, or even at the federal level. You still have uh, opportunity to improve the cost of quality to understand you know, what's having a quality impact on the experience, but you'll have different success measures by what you do with those cost of quality measures. 100%. I mean, you're still taking, if you think of that as it's a reinvestment, right? Mm-hmm. Right. All the, what they're doing is they're taking that, that savings back and they're saying, hey, look, I want to go back and reinvest inside of my resident or my citizen. And I want to make sure that what we save out of this gets reinvested in a way that they get mm-hmm. even better served. Healthcare so and utility also have the same quasi public like approach, which is they're taking the savings and reinvesting them back in. You think of like hospital systems or utilities, they often approach it with that same mindset for customer experience. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean it's yeah, it's very akin to the two are very akin to one another. So, you know, in this um you know, environment that we're talking about, it's it's you know, you have a combination of investment in digital which allows you to reduce the, uh, the amount of um, calls required, the call volume required, and, and provide you know, better service uh, in a flexible way. Um, but you still have human beings that are engaging on calls or in interactions. It's in, and that's true across industries. It's very much digital. Um, and digital is not replacing human experience. So uh, one of the things I love about Qualtrics is the investment you've made in the... Um, uh, the connection between EX and CX, um, both in terms of, um, you know, cross XM experiences uh, and, uh, and really thinking about the frontline employees and how to optimize the experience for them. And love if you could share some of your um, experiences um, about what are the best ways to reinforce this linkage between EX and CX. I love the linkage between the two. And I think it's um, some folks don't tend to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And um, the size of what's inside of the EX side is so much smaller than the customer interactions. And there's a ton in, in the CX to be able to mine. So people tend to start with the CX. But when they start thinking about both of those people, um, it really is a convergence where happy employees drive happy customers. At its core, that's really what it's all about. It is, um, it's as simple as really like you and I get on the phone and we talk to people in customer service all the time, right? When I have an issue, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call somebody. You can tell when that person's having a bad day. I mean, it makes your experience that much worse too on the other side of the phone call, right? Everybody has a bad day. That's okay, right? But being able to know that that individual is going to be better tomorrow because of the way that the company takes care of them means that when the person gets on the phone with that individual tomorrow, that they have a much better experience. We've seen inside of the customers that we work with that uh, the places where customers feel that love, the product or service is interpreted exponentially better, right? Like you see the outcome of happier things, right? Even inside of a, I mean, the one example that comes to mind is a quick service restaurant. People that said, hey, the employee, you know, was happy on the EX side or employee experience side. When you looked at it, people actually said the food tasted better. Like you'd never expect that. Like those two things you'd never equate together. I've had a lot of clients in um, in quick serve, in hotels, in retail, where you can measure the location performance, where the employee engagement and, um, you know, the EX side of it is actually directly statistically correlated to store level or branch level or hotel location level profitability. Yeah, totally makes sense to me, right? And I, we've seen those numbers too, same thing, right? The beauty of that, again, is you're more likely to turn around and go back, 
Like, why wouldn't you go back? You, last time you had a great experience. The person that greets you knows you by name or is friendly towards you. You feel good when you go there. So that's why people return. Well, I mean, and this is, by the way, a core theme in my book, The CX and Culture Connection. It's why this podcast is called The CX and Culture Connection. It's because good CX and good EX go together. Culture is the glue. Culture is how things are done around here, and it's how energy flows in a company. If the culture is positive, the energy is flowing well. If the culture is negative, then it gums things up. People are negative. They're down. It brings everyone down. The energy level goes down, right? Then people look for ways to get their, their fulfillment outside the company if the culture is toxic, right? Um, and uh, But a lot of the, you know, more progressive companies on customer experience is starting to pay attention to EX. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of the listening for EX is still very focused on the hire to retire side of it, which is still good. You know, the HR oriented lens for EX, which is good because happy employees does lead to um, better customer experience. But there's a huge opportunity to focus more explicitly on the behaviors that you want. Now, culture is all about behavior. What are the behaviors you want that your employees to engage in? And that's some of the things we we're talking about earlier in the call about, you know, take the call center as an example. Those are behaviors that we want employees to engage in. And you want them to feel proud of the experience they deliver, which ultimately makes them more fulfilled. Yeah, 100 percent. And ultimately having a mission and a goal inside of there and having them feel like they're part of a mission and a goal and that they're accomplishing something to a higher purpose. Uh, that comes across, right? It comes across, again, on both sides of the conversation. So when you start to listen in the unstructured side of that, you start to feel it come across in the feedback from the individual that says, hey, I'm, I'm in this because, and fill in the blank, right? And as that aligns to the mission and vision for the organization, you also see on the other side of the equation that the happiness that's tied to that employee experience starts to translate into the satisfaction, the spend, um, and all that on the other side. Well, this is a very powerful thing that companies and organizations can do with Qualtrics that I'm excited about, which is to combine behavior activation at scale with modern listening. So you can use the listening to help identify what are the behaviors you want and further refine, you know, uh, you know what is it that we want to do in the experience and translate that to specific behaviors you want people to engage in. And then you can listen for whether those are occurring. Then you can activate the behaviors through your training programs, um, through other means of, uh, of activating behaviors um, to, to actually see whether they're occurring. Um, and then create a constant feedback loop. You know, train people, uh, incentivize the behavior, recognitions and rewards, storytelling, all the things you do to activate behaviors and then use Qualtrics to listen to see whether or not they're occurring and have and, and provide insights to share back to demonstrate opportunities for improvement. And you can actually treat it like habit building loops. Yeah, I love that idea, the habit building loop. I, I love that idea because, I mean, that's what you want from people, right? Build a muscle and reuse that over and over. If you build the right muscle, it means that you execute at the highest level, right? Like we, I used to coach uh, several years ago. I won't say how many. Um, but when I was a coach, we used to say, perfect practice makes perfect. Right? So the idea is to be able to intervene and do that. One of my uh, favorite quotes from Yogi Berra, Greg, is, um, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Yeah. So perfect <laughs> practice makes perfect, right? Yep, 100%. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's the goal. So... Um, uh, you know, what, some of the, what we're talking about now about creating that better listening signal to see whether you're driving the behavior adoption you want, um, a lot of it's dependent on AI. You know, the fact that, uh, that you can use AI to mine all this data. Um, what, what do you see as some of the uh, most exciting advances in AI that, that Qualtrics is in, you know, has been adapting to help improve the um, the, the repertoire for CX and EX? Yeah, I mean, I guess first I'd start with the idea that um, each organization has a different level of tolerance for AI right now. 
right? And it depends on how far you're willing to go and let AI take you in that direction for what you're willing to do in some ways. Meaning that at the far end of the spectrum, you've got the notion of generative or automation, generative automation of answers and responses, right? So we see organizations, some organizations are willing to try that out right now. Um, I think that some of that is uh, an interesting challenge. Some of it works and some of it starting to produce results that makes people a little more skitterish with that. On the public sector, I would say we're a little more risk averse, right? I think organizations in the public sector are stepping back and they're looking at it from kind of the, uh, maybe it's less automated is a better way of putting it, more manual intervention. Like, what should I say inside of here? Suggest that to me. Like, give me an idea of what conversation is occurring. What should I consider responding with inside of here? The second thing I see organizations looking at really is summary of information, right? So there's no harm in taking and looking at it and saying, what was talked about inside of here? Give me a summary of that piece of information so that we have a digestible understanding of what occurred for the record so that somebody picks it up next time that they can look inside of that summary and understand what occurred in the past. So that's kind of the three levels that I guess I would see inside of there is really starting maybe with summaries, going to suggested replies, then going towards uh, generative automation, if you will. I think that's really helpful. And, and just to kind of step back and share something with the audience, like I think this is a really important distinction between the different uses of AI and that in your organization and your readiness and the kind of environment, some things will be easier or more safe to do than others, right? And that doesn't mean you have to go slow on everything because one thing is harder. So for example, Gen AI is red hot and a lot of people are looking at that right now, but some brands are just not comfortable using Gen AI to create content as an example and are, are hitting the brakes and trying to make sure it's brand safe and then there's they're not introducing bias and things like that. And that makes sense. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use AI to develop insights and you can't use AI to optimize real-time journey orchestration. It just means you're gonna be more careful about how you create the content that gets served up in real time. Uh, you can still personalize the content experience with human developed content by using AI and data signals to serve up different versions of the content. It just costs more to create the content that way, you know, and uh, over time, people will embrace Gen AI for more and more of the content. But there's a huge opportunity for insights, activation and measurement, even if you go slower on some of the Gen AI use cases, if they're not right for you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, I think that over time, people get comfortable with it, right? In some ways, even the systems need to be trained into uh, understanding what's going on in your organization's particular uh, set of data, right? If you want to get to the place where you're doing generative beyond the rest, or that you're suggesting actions to people, it's really important that those individuals feel like the data that's coming to them is accurate. Right? And that takes a little bit of training, a little bit of time. I've seen organizations take the other tack to that, which is, hey, let's go jump in the deep end of the pool, if you will. When you jump in the deep end of the pool and you pop something out that wasn't expected, people lose trust. You don't want to lose trust inside of this business, right? We want to be as accurate as we can out of the gates to be able to push the boundaries a little bit, but also be able to provide them the information that will create a better experience for their customers. If you um, are interested in um, getting more on this topic of AI, um, you can check out the podcast I did with Sid Banerjee from, from Qualtrics uh, a number of months ago. He was one of the early guests on the podcast. Um, and uh, also you could check out uh, content from the AI Leadership Council at MMA Global, which is the marketing trade association that I uh, am involved in as a subject expert. We're doing a lot of really cool stuff uh, with AI. Um, in 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 uh, stay tuned for more as how AI applies in customer experience. There's gonna be a lot more stuff this year on that topic. You know, we were talking a little bit, Greg, about you know barriers to change and adoption and how you know that relates to AI. And um, uh, if we brought in the aperture from AI to kind of CX in general, you know, what what are some of the key barriers to change and how do CX leaders better address them? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say the barrier at the heart of it all is probably fear, 
right? And much of that is fear of change. Um, when I start to think about that, that maybe boils down into things like fear of failure or like, hey, I've got something that's good enough. Individuals are looking, some individuals look for career defining moves or career defining change. Those are individuals that we see that are making the moves. We also see other individuals that are searching for a way to get past that fear of change and they look for partners. Right. Most often I see that organizations find individuals that group together around something that's going to make a change for the positive to be able to get past that fear of going it alone. Right. Like sometimes an individual does not want to go it alone. They want to go in a group When they go in a group. They feel like they've got a bond to success together and that they're able to achieve that together. So to me, that's the way to do it is to bond a group together determine what the value of that change can be for the organization, champion that as a cause, prove it out. You know, like you don't need to start with a big bang, but you can prove it out with something that's the equivalent of a proof of concept or a pilot. And as those others see that success, it's going to snowball into a whole bunch of other people joining that cause as well for other ideas outside of what you've tackled at the outset. But I would say that that's probably the, the first one. Um, couple other thoughts. I would say uh, action-oriented culture, right? Like in public sector, sometimes we find organizations that, um, you know, they, they're they settled and comfortable in the way that they're doing business today. And being able to take action on the insights that are delivered out of here is a challenge, right? So activating on it, finding a partner inside of there that is a constituent for, hey, I've got to accomplish something for my group or for the organization as a whole, finding that partner and finding an initial success for that first win is something that's key to overcoming that. And then you take and you publicize the bejesus out of it and you get the opportunity to grow from there. So that's another example, a couple more, but um, I don't know if you want to keep riffing on that or not. No, I think it's that's very true that uh, nothing succeeds like success. Right. And and picking your spots where you can overcome barriers to change, either through, uh, you know, people will embrace what they help create. People like to see uh, momentum and then they'll 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 get behind it. And uh, people also like to see that there's the commitment there. The organization is really committed and this is going to happen. You know, so so like where change is really a barrier where there's change fatigue or resistance to change. I think starting small and picking your spots where you can build some momentum and get people engaged to help evangelize it is a good strategy. Um, and you know, you can have a, a portfolio of initiatives that aren't all moving at the same speed where you pursue them over a road roadmap and pick some things early in the roadmap that are build that momentum and showcase success and also are enablers and lay the foundation for other things to follow. Yeah. hundred percent. Meaning I, I, I understand and appreciate the, the idea of like, you got to build a pathway, right? The pathway starts with one step. It always does. And sometimes I think the hardest thing for people is uh, taking that first step. Um, having a partner that's in it with you too is important. Right? Like one of the things I've also seen from our side is people find it important to know that Goltrix is behind them as well as an organization. Right. And having executive presence and having the executives involved in the health of the relationship for our customers is something that provides also a push for folks because they feel like, hey, I've got a whole other organization behind me, not just my own, but a set of people inside of the company that I'm working with as a real partner, as opposed to just purely a vendor. Well, Qualtrics has evolved a lot itself over the years that I've worked with you guys. You know, it's it's certainly no longer a survey firm. It's one of the world leaders investing in AI to apply it to customer experience. You know, and uh, you're you're straddling customer experience, employee experience, brand experience, product experience, all these different types of experiences that go together. And really, it's about helping create a culture of experimentation, a culture of agility to apply insights, to drive change. And, uh, it's a, it's a great platform for, um, being able to combine different data sets, you know, and experience and operational data and, and, and 
enable insights at your fingertips to make good decisions. Data is king in many ways, right? I mean, when you and I have worked together, I think our customers have been searching for ways to get access to more data that is insightful of the things that they can actually do something about. Right? It's not just data per se, but it's also something that I think that I can take an action on. And ultimately that action results in something back to the brand promise, right? Um, in a way, it's like, how do I circle back and say, this is accomplishing what I was intending to and having a positive business outcome for both me and for the individual, right? It's a symbiotic relationship between customers and the organization that's servicing them and that human interaction between the two of them, right? Really the goal is to fel feel like they've been heard and then when they've been heard, somebody did something about it. The worst thing that an organization can do, I think, is listen and do nothing. Like that is a break of that brand promise. That is a break of the relationship with an individual. Right? That's where we break down as humans, too. If we talk with someone and they don't listen to us or do anything about what we're telling them, if we're having a terrible day and somebody just ignores us, we don't feel like they're being empathetic towards us and they care about what's going on. So when we step back and look at organizations, we're trying to make those organizations be more human as well. We want that organization to listen, understand, be able to be empathetic, and take action on it. Well, Greg, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's um, uh, You sparked some great ideas for me. I, I hope you have for the audience, too. Um, and if, if folks want to get in touch with you, is the easiest way on LinkedIn, or do you suggest anything, anything beyond that? Yeah, they can reach out to me through LinkedIn. I'm certainly available inside of there. And I think my email and stuff is public inside of there as well. So glad, glad to continue Fantastic. the conversation with anybody who's interested. Thanks again, Greg, for coming on today. It's been great to have you on the podcast. I really enjoy all our conversations. Uh, folks can reach out to either Greg or me on LinkedIn and be sure to um, follow and subscribe to the podcast. And uh, hope you have a great day, everybody. Thank you.